<clears throat> hey, Yossi, you want to take over real quick? I'm going to head back to the uh, other webinar. I want to help them out. Yes, I will get started. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. Welcome um, to our, our second session of the New Philanthropy Summit. I'm Yossi from the Lenfest Institute, and I'm going to turn it over to Tamara and Sarah from Searchlight New Mexico in just a moment, but want to share a couple few small housekeeping details. Um, just a reminder about our event principles, which are listed on the main Zoom um, panel, and I'll post them in the chat in just a minute. Really, we just ask that everyone treats each other with respect. Um, the session's being recorded. We will um, be share it um, publicly following the summit, so just be cognizant of that. And um, we're in a Zoom meeting, also not a Zoom webinar, so um, please keep yourself on mute, though we hope you'll chime in when appropriate. There's closed captioning available as well. And if you're having any technical difficulties, please just feel free to DM me. Um, uh, yeah, and so if you're, we'll take questions at the end and potentially spend some time in breakout. So feel free to use the chat and the Q&A function um, at the bottom. And so with that, we're thrilled you're here and I will throw it over to Tamara and Sarah from Searchlight New Mexico to get us started. Thank you, Yossi. Uh, we're so happy to be here with you today. And um, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into the slides because we do wanna save time to hear from you and be somewhat in dialogue with you and answer any questions that you have. So, today we're, we're talking about a way to develop relationships with donors that's based on shared vision. When I meet with a potential donor, I often don't even talk about money I definitely don't start by talking about what the organization needs, like more staff or something like that. I always begin with talking about the vision of what the organization is trying to accomplish. And I focus my comments on inspiration and aspiration. When I first met Sarah Solovich, who's the executive director and executive editor of Searchlight New Mexico, um, I met her as a, I was a donor to her organization. I love their work. This was um, about four years ago when Sarah first came to New Mexico. So I didn't work for Searchlight. I was just an interested community member. And she really, um, you know, had asked me about raising money. And so I was talking to her about this approach that I use with people, um, inviting people in, listening to them, responding to their ideas. Sarah felt like that came into conflict with her training as a journalist and that it potentially crossed lines of editorial integrity. Um, this is a conversation that I also had with INN's current development director, Stephanie Schenkel. She said this is a common response that um, journalists have when they begin their journey raising money. Um, I think today we, have, we probably have a very diverse audience of people who are very experienced fundraisers and have been raising money from major donors for quite a while as well as some new people here. And we hope that our comments will be beneficial to both new people and experienced people. Um, so here's some questions that I wanted to pose for us today. And please put your comments in the chat. And after Sarah gives some examples and speaks, we will be returning to your thoughts. So as journalists, how do we raise money for our work without feeling like we might be compromising editorial integrity? And how can journalism organizations create meaningful relationships with donors who want to be involved and still feel like we're holding power to account? We're going to explore ways to walk those lines where you don't feel compromised and your supporters don't feel shut out from your mission and work. Um, the other thing that I want to say, the main thing I want to impart today is if it feels yucky, don't do it. So I found as, you know, my, my first job was a, at a program, as a program officer at a foundation. Then I became a development director. Then I eventually became a financial advisor at UBS. And so even though I've done all these different things, it's always dealt with money and with people who have money and people who want to do something with their money. And one thing I've noticed is that when it comes to money, we often treat it like it's a different animal um, and that we almost put it in this other box completely separate from what we're doing and what we care about. 
and that we almost expect it to feel bad or to feel wrong. And so today I wanna to counter any narrative that you might hold that you have to learn a completely new skill set or become a different person in order to raise money and that the best way to raise money is to feel completely comfortable doing so. It's to harness your power as a storyteller um, and, and speak from your vision, your mission, what you care most passionately about. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Sarah Solovich who is going to speak about um, her journey from going from not even knowing how to read a nonprofit budget to raising over a million dollars a year, which is no small feat. Hello, nice to be here. And it, it's true, I actually didn't know how to raise a budget, um, to read a budget. When I first came to Searchlight in 2017, about $750,000 had been raised and I thought that was a fortune. I was also assured at the time that as an editor, there would be no expectations on me to raise money, so I didn't pay any attention to it. A few months into the job, the um, executive director came to me and, uh, well actually, he gave me his the budget and he said, you should be familiar with this. And at that point, I just threw it into a drawer and never looked at it. Um, but a few months after that, he came to me and said, the money is all gone. And um, you have two months before you need to close down shop. Well, at that point, I started reaching out to people, um, people I thought might possibly help. And the first person I really reached out to was a former editor of mine at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, I'd worked for him off and on for years, and he had gone to a major foundation. And I called him up, and I remember walking around this huge conference table for probably two hours because it went from light to dark. It was like kind of black by the time we finished our conversation. And I just explained to him what I was trying to do. And I remember at the end of the conversation, he said to me, what is the problem besides money? And I said, there, there is no problem, it's only money. And a week and a half maybe, I had, I had money. Um, and at that point, I was just that little bit of luck. I mean, and it, and it really, part of it was total luck. And then, but the other part of it is, has to do with this maxim that I've since heard in fundraising, which is, that people do not give money to foundations. They give money to people. And tapping into your network and the people you know and who trust you and believe in you, and you know, it's it's just, um, you know, it doesn't mean you're always gonna get something, but there are, um, there's so much to be said for making connections with people. I have actually made offers to fly to Chicago just to have coffee with somebody. Nobody's ever taken me up on that, fortunately, but um, I would have done it if I'd been given the opportunity. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about how the focus on child and family well-being became like a central touchstone to being able to raise significant yeah, funds? That's a good point. Well, we were lucky enough to have a very clear mission. Um, we were founded with the idea that we would write about family and child well-being in New Mexico. So any time that I've reached out to a foundation or a philanthropist or an individual, it's always been with a very clear purpose in mind that we know what we're doing. We are, you know, our, we have a mission. And either, you know, I usually try to find people who are interested in those same causes and will allow me to carry them into what we are trying to do. So it also allows me to know very clearly, you know, I cannot broach that line. And they, they either are going to follow and be interested in what we're doing or there's really nothing to talk about. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the um, 
how you've, how you've used events to create community? The other thing we did besides have a very clear agenda about what we were writing about was to be passionate about the aesthetics of our website. Early on, we had a photographer who retired less than a year ago, but he was more a documentary photographer than a photojournalist. And he had a very strong aesthetic. He also wanted to only do black and white. And I quickly realized that I just had a real, like, he was gold. I just, he was one of the best photographers in the Southwest. His name is Don Usner. And I worked, you know, I mean, I just basically let him call the shots about how we were going to, what we were going to look like, what the photography was going to look like. And that also led to numerous events that we were able to hold, including exhibits. Um, you know, Santa Fe is a very arts oriented place to live. There is a huge interest in photography and based on a couple major photographic projects that we did, one was called the Once and Future Child. And it was kind of going back to the very beginnings of photography in New Mexico and the Southwest, where you know it was kind of the locus of, of photography going beyond the WPA, going to you know um, Curtis, Russell Curtis, and and others, A Edward Curtis, sorry, and then Russell Lee is, is the other person I was thinking about. But um, there was such a history of photography, and then we, you know, took that and moved it to Don's own photo photo photography, and we had exhibits. Um, around the state, and that also brought people to us. Um, you found some of your first major donors that way. That's right. And when we had a couple major donors who we needed to thank in a personal way, we ended up giving them Dawn's, a photograph of Dawn's that had been, um, you know, sealed with museum quality glass and beautifully framed. And that and those kinds of gifts actually were really, I think, meaningful to major donors because after all, they, they don't need another tchotchka. They don't care about, you know, another canvas bag or a, a mug. So these were like really, I think they became thoughtful gifts that also carried kind of the stamp of searchlight with them. Okay. Another you, thing I was going to talk about the, the magazine. magazine. Yeah. yeah. So after we'd been in business for about a year, we created a magazine that was essentially um, kind of a, an amalgam of all our, the best stories that we had done during the previous year. Um, we shortened them, we made them very graphic heavy, and the initial idea was that we would take this magazine to the legislature, you know, very idealistic, and tell these legislators who hardly read, <laughs> um, hey, this, these are the issues that are so important that we think you need to weigh in on. Um, that didn't work that well, to be quite honest. What we discovered with this magazine was that it, to our surprise, worked as um, a kind of introduction, almost like a calling card for donors. And so when our reporters go out, when I go out and meet with, you know, potential donors and philanthropists, I have brought this magazine along with me. Sometimes they just happen, people find it by accident and we've received, you know, occasionally $10,000 checks as a result of some individual who saw the magazine. So that's been really useful to us and we've continued to do it on an annual basis. Our new one just came out a week ago. We mail it out to all our foundations, all our anybody, any donor over $250. And we're even now having um, a magazine launch party at the local bookstore here in Santa Fe. Um, we've also for the first time started selling ads. So we're thinking about how we can monetize um what we do and thanks to tomorrow we sold a lot of ads um which the slide actually, is also talking about the q and a's that we do with reporters 
which has been a good way to diversify our funding base a bit and also find some new board members and just engage the community in a different way. Right, I'd almost forgotten about that. So occasionally, if we have a story that's really especially impactful and uh, meaningful to a lot of people, we've used it as an opportunity to kind of leap off and have an event. Sometimes we've done that in, um, you know, very quickly. For instance, we had a story about six months ago about the jail in Albuquerque and how understaffed and dangerous it's become. So dangerous, in fact, that the um, the district attorney or the um, public defender will no longer allow his own lawyers to go into the jail and consult with their clients because there's just not enough guards present. And it was, it was um, a pretty hard hitting piece and we ended up finding a bar in, you know, um, in Albuquerque for our reporter to go and give a presentation at and the public defender attended it with him. So that was a way, we've done numerous events like that. We've even brought in experts who are sources from around the country They'll usually, well, always, because we don't pay them. They'll fly in, we'll pay for their airfare, and then they'll come and do a presentation with us for a large group of people. And it's not that that necessarily, you know, we don't charge tickets for it, but we do find, we hope that it's going to bring more people into the, you know, searchlight community. So that's a big one. The other thing I guess I'd like to say is that um, for a couple years, even um, when I became executive director, I was strongly urged to hire a development director. And I was very resistant to it. I just wanted to take all the money that at that point I was bringing in and plow it back into journalism. I wanted to hire more reporters and, you know, get an additional editor and do more photography, all of that, right? And it took me a while before I realized that we really did need a development director. And that's when I reached out to Tamara, who I knew from the community. We had, you know, had coffee together numerous times. I realized she was somebody who cared passionately in what Searchlight you know, is committed to, and it was just a very natural relationship to bring her on board. I also knew that she was somebody I could trust and work with. So that's very, um, it's, I think it's just so important because otherwise, you know, people for like us who are just, you know, like journalists or if, if um, have a, I think a hard time, as she said, thinking about money. Right now I wanna stop the share and see, um, you'll see what's been going on in the chat because I actually haven't had an opportunity to look. Um, yeah, we have some really terrific comments and questions and one that's had a number of thumbs up that I can point out if that's okay um, is Diane Sylvester says, lesson learned humbly. It's always helpful to know slash define your mission and not play to a funder. It's better to find funders that actually align with your goals than twist yourself to meet a, a big donor's priorities. Um, Does anyone, I, I just want to invite anybody to unmute themselves and, you know, share a story about a successful relationship that you've been able to cultivate or share your thoughts on our opening questions that were about editorial integrity and, and how you've dealt with that yourself and your organization. Yeah, if you want to raise your hand, use a little raise your hand reaction. I can spotlight you uh, so you can bring you up on stage here. Or any other question that you have for Sarah or I on, on raising money for Searchlight? Um, I just more. wanted to say that I just wanted to thank you for, um, this is Stephanie Shankel. I'm from the Institute for Nonprofit News, um, INN. And I just um, wanted to 
Oh, start my video. Okay, sure. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Being asked to start my video. Here I am. Um, I just wanted to thank you for reinforcing to people how important it is to hire development staff because I know with tight budgets, it's really challenging and it's it's something that we often push aside. And um, I'm here to say it's critically important, even if you can't afford a full-time person, if you can bring on a consultant or a part-time staff person that um, it goes such a long way in, in building long-term sustainability. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Thank you. Uh, so now we have Aparna and we have Claire. Right. Hi, my, my question's directly related to what Stephanie just said. We, I'm the newest, uh, second newest hire here at Resolve Philly, and we are about to embark on our first search for a full-time development person. And I'm curious, what's, if you have any specifics, whether it's criteria or language or anything to recommend in when you're searching for this kind of development officer or someone who, you know, there's, I think just, it really resonated the idea of, hey, we didn't know if we wanted someone full-time working on this. And I feel like there's something a little bit more special and specific that I think most of us are seeking that might overlap versus the bigger corporate philanthropy. Yeah, I can speak directly to that because since I was so resistant, but I was also being pushed very clearly into in this direction. By the board. Yes. I ended up treating it like a reporting assignment. And I called people all around the country. I, um, other I, developers, um, fundraisers, developers um, from major nonprofits, by the way, including several who um, are speaking at this event this week you know, in this, these couple of days, um, I called um, founders and, and EDs of other organizations. And I still have my notes about that. And there's probably like, I don't know, 30,000 words or maybe more. It was like, all, you know, like for a long mag, like 100,000 words. It's just this document that goes on and on and on because I had it for weeks and even months at a time and i would occasionally go back and start all and how do you find a development director not only it is the organization ripe for a development director because i didn't ascribe to that and i guess i yeah i think there are times when you really need is you know do you need a full-time is a part-time how do you hire i mean i could hire a reporter i know what a good reporter is and how to talk to a reporter but I don't know what a good development director is. I didn't even know really what they did, but much less, how do you find somebody who's not a charlatan, right? I think, you know, what I had, had been told very early on was that development directors typically don't stay in their jobs for very long. And it's for one of two reasons. Either they don't do their jobs and don't raise them the money, or they only raise the money for their own um, positions, or they're so good that then they are, you know, like lured away by other nonprofits. So it was um, a very, I, I, it was almost like I kind of fell into it. I was thinking, wait a minute, Tamara, Tamara Bates, you know, like I know, I know somebody who I think would work. Um, I want to add something. Go ahead. <laughs> From my perspective, because Sarah, probably asked me to work for Searchlight over a period of three years. That's right. And in the beginning, you know, how I started the presentation today, just saying, you know, when I would describe my approach and how I raised money, and Sarah kind of poo-pooed everything I said. And I wasn't sure that I could come in and be successful because one thing that I find executive directors, if they want to structure things and they, okay, here, the development person, they're the person who's responsible for raising the money and they don't think that they're partners with that person, I know I will not be successful. So I've raised money for probably 20 different organizations. I've raised millions of dollars um, across the country. And I have found if I cannot partner, if the ED is not my 100% partner and they are not doing the asks, I will not be successful in raising the money. Um, and that it really is my job to be setting things up um, for them to make the ask, but um, I know we have a lot of things to talk about. Anyway, but I just want to tell one more thing, which is that this last summer, Sarah came to me and said, please, please help me. And I said, okay, 
you've never listened to me. Are you going to listen to me this time? And she said, yes. So anyway, we've been able to work everything out and, and I'm very happy. <laughs> We're both very opinionated women. <laughs> so Yossi, what's going on? I know there was somebody else who was going to speak and then there's been a lot of, um, some people, somebody yeah. asked about board development. So we skipped Lorelai and I feel bad. So I got her up here now. Lorelai, go ahead and ask your question. And then we have Claire and Janice who would also like to ask if we have time. Claire and Janice, we may have to, Wait if they have more to say, but uh, Tamara, uh, if you are willing, we can take both. So Lorelai, go ahead. Yes. Hi, thank you. Thank you, ladies. I'm from Farmington in the Four Corners. So oh, I really am delighted by what you're doing. New Mexico needs it um, so much. Uh, I'm at Georgetown and I've been working um, with the Congress for the last six years to bring uh, up to date the technology and data capacity. Um, and there's all sorts of rules changes and new capacity in Congress now. And one of the things is the return of member-directed spending, also called earmarks formerly. But there, um, there's something that community organizations can apply for if you're a local government or a local nonprofit. And they were averaged $1.8 million a piece uh, last year. Um, it seems to me that it would be a great, if we flood the zone with sort of news with integrity that serves the local community, uh, you know, community stewards, have you thought about that? Do you know about um, the return of member-directed spending? Uh, I know that the New Mexico members would be delighted, I think. And I know the members who introduced it in Congress were really looking for building community resilience and peace building. Um, that was their intent. Hmm. I'll look into it. Well, you'll yeah. Look into <laughs> yeah, I think Local News Fund is probably working on that too. But yes, mm -hmm. we should. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lorelai. And let us know if you come back to visit New Mexico. <laughs> I will. Hi, uh, thanks so much for doing this. And my question is around the journalistic integrity and, you know, developing relationships with major donors. Um, so I'm from the Connecticut Mirror. I'm fairly new in this job, and I'll just echo that my organization also had a hard time finding a development director, major gifts person, um, just because I think it's important for a person to connect with the mission. So I'm a former journalist, which is why I started doing it. Um, but anyways, I'm getting off track. <laughs> um, no, it's totally on track. I, I echo that, believe in the mission. I mean, that was me. I I first learned about Searchlight and I just called them up like, I want to help you. This is the best writing I've ever read in New Mexico, you know? So, I mean, I think you want the person raising money to be so passionate about your organization too. Right. Yeah. That's so, that's what I would echo to anyone who's like looking for a development director. What do we, what do we look for in them? Just look for an interest in the, the mission that you do. So in the short six months that I've been doing this with the Connecticut Mirror, Journalistic integrity always comes up in the conversations of major donors, major giving. Um, and from my interactions with, uh, you know, major supporters of the Connecticut Mirror, I've never felt that pressure from them that they were trying to influence what we do. And maybe it's just our approach that we're set very clear guidelines around the relationships that we don't attract that kind of person. But nevertheless, I feel like editorial still struggles with the concept of, you know, us building these relationships with major donors and are still a bit skeptical that their independence, authenticity, integrity is potentially threatened as we like even look for ways for newsroom and the fundraising teams to engage and collaborate with these people who are supporting us. So I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts or guidance around bringing editorial in, helping them understand what we do a little bit more. Yeah. You know, cause you speak right from the journalism side and, you know, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, you know, early on, in Searchlight's life, we had a couple days where we were, this happened two years in a row, where we brought in um, a very prominent journalist who had left newspapers. And we worked with him on creating 
you know, the culture of the newsroom. That was, you know, kind of what we, how we described it. And one of the things that he said fairly often was how much more comfortable he was working with individuals, philanthropists, um, you know, readers and asking for money rather than the old days when it was all about ads and taking mm -hmm. money from, from businesses. And he made this very strong point, like why is one better than the other? Journalism actually needs money. One of the most valuable things we do in the magazine every year, we have a whole page and it's a graphic and it says um, what investigative journalism costs. And we have a pie chart basically that breaks it down. And we take like one series of stories. This year it was the fires in New Mexico. And we'll show like, what was the cost of our reporting? That's always probably 70%. I wish I had it here and I would show you. Um, what's the, what was the cost of the editing, you know, for all of this? And, you know, like one thing after another so that people see, oh, wow, those stories cost you $88,000 to produce. How do you think we're actually paying that? And I've also, to get to your point about the journalists and how to, you know, how bringing them along, um, journalists often don't understand or think about, you know, what's supporting their work. And mm -hmm. I've had conversations, you know, at meetings where I've actually kind of laid it out for them. This is how, yes, we got a grant for you for $50,000 to write about oil and gas, for instance. That's, you know, that that's a one-year project. But that doesn't mean we turn over the $50,000 or $150,000 to you. And that has come up in the past. No, this is what's creating, it's paying your salary, it's paying your benefits, it's paying the photography, that it's paying the, the editors who are supporting you and, and, and editing your work so closely. And it's like there's this aha moment. Based on that, then we can say to them, when, and we have, it, well, it's not based on that, it's like we have an event and we'll ask somebody, hey, come, would you like to come to the event and speak? To, you know, and tell people what your story and your work means to you and how you're not going to be able to do this anywhere else. Nobody else in, so I'm just talking about New Mexico and Searchlight, but there's nobody else in New Mexico who's spending, you know, three months on a, on a single story because that is our mission and that's what we were created to do and we're intended to be you know, like a third arm, a, you know, an investigative team for all the newspapers in New Mexico that don't have that. And we give them our work for free. But when reporters start to understand that, then I think they're much more willing to say, you know, like the magazine, for instance, we're having a, a magazine launch party at a bookstore on Saturday night. And I'm, I've got two reporters who are coming in to read from their stories, basically treat them like you know, they're like writers, they're authors, and they're going to read from their stories and then take questions from the audience. How did I get that story? How did I report it? Just the, you know, this is what people want. I think they're really hungry for it. And I have no problem giving them that. I feel like that that's the best thing I can do. I think the more the editorial people are engaged in the fundraising, the more, I mean, to me, that's, where Sarah had a shift in her thinking is that she actually went out and raised the money. And through that experience and learning how to raise money, then that shifted her mindset. So to the extent that you can have, again, like partnering with people in a specific way, I think that's really like the only way to have the editorial side understand the fundraising side is if they do it. Or probably the shortest way or the best way. Okay, I know there's lots going on. Um, Yossi, what are, what are your thoughts based on reading the chat? Do you think we should go into the breakout rooms or keep talking as a group? You did, sorry, unmuting myself. I think there's still some folks with some questions. And so if everyone's okay with it, I think 
sticking here. There's lots of activity in the chat. Folks were interested in the what you were describing in terms of outlining the cost of the journalism, if there's an example for that, and we're happy to distribute that if if you have that. And I know Janice wanted to jump in in a moment. So if you want to raise your hand again, we can spotlight you, Janice, and, and feel free to hop in. I'll just, I don't know how well this will but we can show share. up. We'll but... share it with everybody. Yeah. I'll put it in my That's... slide deck. Perfect. And we'll share the slides and, and share the recording with everyone. That's what I look okay. like. Janice, you are, um, you are unmuted and you can speak, but we can't spotlight you unless you turn your video on. So if you don't want to, you can just talk now. Um, thanks so much. I am going to choose not to turn on my video because I'm a little bit sick and you don't really want to see me right now. Um, totally. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, highlight and thank um, Tamara for talking about um, the need for directors of development. I, I am not a journalist. I'm with a Harpswell anchor up here in Harpswell, Maine. It's a nonprofit paper that I, I founded um, to relaunch about two years ago. Um, but I come from 35 years of, of development experience, and um, I find that my relationship with our editor, so I'm sort of the publisher slash director of development, and then there's the editor, and the two of us feel like we are two parts of the same job. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely co-directors. Nobody reports to each other. And I do find that if you don't have a professional fundraiser and, and a professional fundraiser tomorrow that you were talking about with relationship building. There are so many bad fundraisers out here. I could tell you that. And yes, yeah, you're, you're, you're nodding really, really bad. I mean, I had a donor thank me for not putting in a, a, a gift envelope into my acknowledgement for his thousand dollar gift. And I oh. said, people don't do that. He said, they do that all the time. And yeah. and when you're looking at it, and I love the relationship between the two of you too, and how tomorrow said she didn't really understand in the beginning because it's a lot of relationship building. I say to people, I ask, I ask five percent of the time, and mm -hmm. and when you do that, and when you have the time and the money and the focus to do that, it pays off in spades. And nice. I also understand there were a couple of people in the chat saying how do you do this if you don't have any money to hire somebody? And I totally get that too. You, you have to remember that as directors of development, we're, we're cost centers, but we're also profit centers. We will, we will bring in more money than, than we cost. And you have, that's another thing I really want to recommend for someone who's looking for a director of development. You can have someone come in and say, sure, I'll run the annual fund. I'll do the acknowledgements. I might do an event or two. Um, but it's sort of like low line. Like if you say to a director of development, this is our mission. You have to believe and be passionate about the mission. And we want you to take us to the next step. Here are our goals. You know, we really need to raise X number of dollars. How would you do that? Like if you sat down right now, how would you go about doing it? Because there are a lot of us who are very, um, we're not very proactive. We will sit down and do a job, but we won't, you know, go that extra mile. So anyway, don't want to take up too much time. I just think you guys are right on, and I'm really happy to hear it because it's, again, there are two kinds of development. You, you, you want someone who's really comfortable with it who knows that that you're bringing a lot of value and you're really happy about it, not to say like, oh, gee, I need to ask you for money right now. I'm really sorry, um, but you know we do a good job. Don't you think we, you know, that sort of attitude. Anyway, brava, both of you. It's, it's great. Um, there Somebody had asked about board development. Oh, is that what you're going to say? Yes. That was exactly the question I was going to ask. Yeah. So, okay, go what was? Here. Can we go back to that question? Let's see, what was it? Yeah, I have it right here. It was. Um, I now lost it, but yeah, you both spoke about the importance of um, uh, board development, and so I'm curious how you're thinking about engaging your board, and as you're thinking about growing a board is philanthropy and fundraising capacity and those relationships, something that, that you have in mind. And Danny had just raised his hand. So I don't, maybe he was the person that had the question. No. Okay. Um, 
One of the things, so I was actually brought onto the board of Searchlight before I became the development director um, this last June. And one of the first things I did was I just started interviewing each board member um, around their specific interests. Why were they involved in Searchlight? What did they care about? What, why did they stay? What do they still want to contribute? Um, and that way I, I really got a sense of who each person was. Um, and then I created a, a three-year strategic plan and did a lot of work with the executive committee on this plan and also showing this nonprofit life cycle chart to show people, you know, we're at the five-year mark right now. At the five-year mark, here are some things that happen. Because I think a lot of times people don't put into context where an organization is at and the board members have all kinds of ideas about you know, when I sent it to them, they, they all were like, well, we're at the mature stage, right? I'm like, no, we're at the adolescent stage. You know, fortunately, the chart had some, some years on it. I'm like, we're just transitioning now to having systems be more clear, to separating out some of the leadership responsibilities, to having more capacity at the leadership level. So after we went through this whole process, then I also started by asking the board members to um, come up with their matching pledge before the end of the year. Um, and that was interesting too, because when Searchlight was founded and we still have many of our founding board members, the board was told this will not be a fundraising board. It was a board mostly of very high level journalists. And Sarah would always tell me this, you know, before I was even involved, the board doesn't think they're, and I'm like, there's no such thing as a nonprofit board that is not a fundraising board. Like, I'm sure, you know, I'm, I understand that they think that, but like, we have to get them to a new understanding. And we've been able to do that. I think talking, having conversations with individual board members and doing it that way, That's and right. then creating a plan that reflects all of their feedback. That was really, I think, the most powerful way to get everybody on the same page in support of the goals. And then once everybody's on the same page, in support of goals, then you can talk about how they're going to participate in raising money. Hi, Mark Glazer. I see some of our New Mexico people are here. Um, amazing. Danny, Danny, but Danny had a question, or is there somebody before him? Nope, Danny's next. Go ahead, Danny. Looks like Danny's next. Hi, thanks for being here. I have two questions. Um, one has to do with the size of your organization to give us some perspective. Um, and the other has to do with maybe a general question about expanding the reach. Um, I know that New Mexico has about 2 million people in it. And some of us serve audiences that are much smaller and some serve larger audiences or potential audiences. How big were you when you decided it's really time to hire a development director? And um, I'll shut up for a minute. It was about two years ago where there really became a drumbeat that this is time to, you know, to hire one. How um, many people did you have then? How many people? Oh, let's see. I think we had three reporters and two editors and a photographer, maybe eight people. I think that was the number, seven or eight people total. Now we're at 11. Um, Okay, so a whole bunch of us can relax that uh, we're, we're still too early. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. Because it's a really fine line to walk. You want to make sure that the journalism is at a, you know, a pace and a standard, the quality is there, that you can, you know, you have something to take to, to the public, to foundations, to, you know, because there's, like when I first, came to Searchlight five years ago, there were, I think, 250 members of INN. Um, how many are there now? It's like 800 to 1,000, some, like it's huge, right? And so, I mean, and you've got all these for-profit newspapers that are, have decided to become non-profit newspapers. There's a lot of competition for our work. And I, for me, I, I moved here, you know, to New Mexico from California, and it wasn't just to do the same old. I was, you know, finding it hard enough to, you know, get my stories, stories I cared about published. And I knew what the problem was, you know, from a journalist perspective. 
But so I didn't want to come here and just add to the noise. It had to, you know, be worthwhile. Thank you. The other half of the question was how to expand the reach of, uh, well, how to expand the number and percent of people who think that journalism is a category worth supporting with philanthropic mm -hmm. money? It's constant education. Mm -hmm. I mean, I meet with people, and these are people who are well read, well positioned, well financed, and I start to talk about the free fall in journalism and what's happening and with the shrunken resources. And their response, I'd say six or seven out of 10 is really, I didn't know that. And you really, it, it demands repeating, even if you think that you're talking to somebody who knows the, the status or they might say, oh yeah, I heard that, but they don't really know what that means. And once you start to explain to them and then they put it together with the politics and the, you know, the, you know, the fake news, all the things that we deal with on a regular basis. It, you know, it's like ding, 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 you know, they start to get it. So I find that like really significant. And then when I tell people, you know, we're giving away our stories for free, which is probably what most of our models look like in nonprofit journalism, then it, it just carries an additional weight. But it's, it's um, just kind of going back um, sometimes to ground zero. Thank you. Um, thank you, Danny. That was two great questions. And Andres de la Pena, you have your hand up as well. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so a little bit of, of context of, of the sort of work that I'm doing here. Uh, I'm working in, a, in Mexico. Uh, with two really, really small organizations. One is like, mm, one has four people full-time and the other, the other one has five people full-time. And so here, like the context of what's happening here, it's a, it's a little bit complex because we do have really, really large media outlets, uh, massive media outlets. Um, and they sort of, sometimes they, they capture the, entire, the entirety of the attention of all major, um, funding options, you know, like Open Society Foundations, Ford Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, Kellogg's, they all go, they all go to these like uh, very trusty and like very time proven options. And it's extremely hard for small organizations to actually initiate these relationships. So I, I have been listening to your stories and I, I think it's interesting that there's, many times you have mentioned that you started like going through your lists of contacts uh, or you hired someone like a professional and we're talking about like the problem we have here is that these independent organizations that are really small are actually doing like the most impactful stories here they're winning international prizes uh, they're winning national prizes but they have zero funding like the one the organization that i'm working on like mostly for has a yearly budget of, of sixteen thousand dollars you know and that's it like that that's for everything even for for accounting even for the legal person even for design for webmasters that's it that's the whole budget so um what do you do when you're an organization that doesn't even have that list of contacts that really can't hire like a uh, like a full professional. I, I think you can tell by my face that I'm actually quite young to be leading this kind of work, but it's like, it's, this is the best we have here. Uh, <laughs> this is what these organizations can do. And they're also overshadowed by these really huge organizations that they can travel abroad to talk with open society. They can travel abroad. They, they do have like these large lists of contacts, but I'm really worried about how the smallest of the smallest organizations can start this process and they can start making those lists of contacts. Uh, they can start uh, getting in touch with the right people uh, and how they can start sort of like uh, saying, hey, we exist, we're out here. Because ironically, these really small organizations are making the most impactful stories. And ironically, even the journalists that work at these large media outlets, when they're going to do like the stories of their lifetimes and when they're going to do like their, their, their magnum opuses, they, they work independently with these really small outlets. And once they're done, they go back to their huge outlet to work their, their nine to five job, you know? 
So how can these small organizations start uh, or kickstart this, this sort of networking process? Which would be the best place to start? Do you know Mega Radio? Si. Yeah? Okay. Um, so it's this huge radio kind of network that broadcasts to like a million people around the Paseo del Norte region of New Mexico, Texas, New Mexico. Um, one thing we did, and I wish we could still do it, but virtually everybody on our staff is fluent in Spanish. We've sent a couple reporters down to talk. I mean, they ate it up. They, they just, they want, they're looking for people to go on radio and talk about their stories. And it was very time consuming for us. And I can't promise it's going to amount to anything, but that's the kind of thing that if you can go online and talk to people in that whole region, um, you know, of Northern Mexico and reaching out across the border, I mean, that will certainly get you attention. Those, a lot of the, well, you know, what we've kind of struggled with is branding and marketing. And I was always kind of on the fence. Do we need to brand ourselves or do we need to raise money? Because it just seemed like the two problems were so, you know, kind of just in some ways, they're not the same people, but they're completely codependent on each other. And um, we really need to market ourselves. I think we're doing a better job, but for instance, you know, because we give our stories to like every newspaper in New Mexico and beyond, well beyond, but especially in New Mexico, a lot of times they don't like acknowledge a searchlight story the way they should. Um, and so people, and this has happened many times, um, people, philanthropists will come to me and say, I read a really great investigative piece in the Albuquerque Journal or wherever. Could happen anywhere in New Mexico. You should write about that. It was our story. Um, and so what um, do you, yeah. Oh, I just, Andres, I'm wondering if you can partner with any of these larger organizations in order to get on some of these larger funders radar, is there any like area of alignment where you could do something? I also would encourage you to find the program officer. You know, if mm -hmm. you can figure out who the person is at Ford and Kellogg and these other places that are funding the larger organizations and reach directly out to them yourself and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm working for these two different organizations that are doing some of the, the most groundbreaking work. It's these smaller organizations that really have the, the information and the beat and the pulse of the community because all these large foundations are talking about really being representative of community. If I would just um, have events so that you start to see who comes, you know, who are your allies, who is reading you, I always start with the people that are like the biggest, um, the fan club, even if you think those people don't have resources to give you. But if you start from the people who care the most and then you go out from there and it's like the people that they know and um, so on. But then also it always feels good when you're starting with the people that already care about you and the people who don't have to be convinced. But many times when I'm trying to find support for something, and I have worked with a lot of different startup organizations in a variety of sectors, I find who has the resources, who has the money, and I figure out a way to stand next to them, what, however that looks. Yeah. You know, I mean, however that makes sense to align in some way and to get on people's radar. Because if, if you can just kind of move towards these larger organizations in a way that again makes sense and and fits with what you're already doing that's how you can i think start to get on the radar of some of these larger funders and we're reporters like, oh, right we just we can you know we can find anybody that doesn't mean they're going to say yes when they when when, when after we've left. identified yeah. them and got their phone numbers but at least we can find them we know how to get to them it's a like people you think you have no a connection to that when it when it comes to six degrees of separation in journalism it's more like three 
great. I just great wanted piece. to thank you. Go over our last, just our last slide. We have five minutes left. Um, thank you so much for a very lively conversation. That was my hope for today. Um, where is my slideshow thing? Here. Okay. So I just wanted to point out this one piece. Um, that I find very helpful when you're starting to work with major donors, with individual donors, is you know a lot of times you'll have a lunch with someone, it seems to go really well, but then you know how do you get the gift? Because you know I've had a lot of lunches where we don't talk about money and the person just hands me a check at the end of lunch because they understand that that's what the meeting was about. However, you know that's sometimes that's rare. So. You know, moving people along this continuum, you've had lunch, you've had a conversation, it's gone really well. How do you actually get that person to start giving you money? And I just try to plan um, a complete calendar of events and different things that are going to match different people's interests. And then I start tracking, you know, what did inspire that person to give money? So you have the lunch, you have a great conversation, then maybe you invite them to an event after the event, either at the event or after the event, there's an ask, did they respond? Um, normally, I think the industry statistics are that it's around um, three times that someone has to be asked for money before they will give. So it might be that these, these relationships that you're nurturing, um, again, you have to have several touch points for that person before they actually give you a contribution. I also, you know, my approach is definitely not a pressurized one. It's not a transactional one. I'm not a fan of telling people how much to give. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, asking for a specific amount. Um, I think sometimes, you know, people do respond to pressure, but then they won't give to you again. So um, we look forward to, you know, Please reach out and email either one of us if you have any thoughts following this. I always ask for a meaningful gift. That's good language too, right? I think high net worth people, they know how much they can give. They know how much they want to give before they sit down and even meet with you. They already have a number in mind. These people ultimately, I mean, we're talking about the, the really generous big givers. Eventually they become my friend. <laughs> And um, I mean, they're people I care about. I might not socialize with them, but I genuinely care about. And when we get together for dinner, we're talking about books. You know, we could have a whole conversation about Stephen Sondheim's music. I mean, they're not, you know, just about the, you know, like, gimme, gimme, gimme. Um, so yes, that you when said I, you usually feel elated, like with our, often, our largest donor, Sarah feels like excited, happy, elated when she leaves the dinner with her. And that's the feeling that we want to encourage you all to nurture with all your relationships. And I'm just seeing that um, a lot of people in the chat are saying that you do feel inspired. And that makes me so happy because mm -hmm. that was my goal for today. Really, my number one goal is just to approach all this stuff about money with some lightness, um, some joy, and definitely a sense of meaning. Um, incredible. This discussion was amazing. We could have continued for another hour or two. So thank you, Tamara and Sarah. This was wonderful. We had a whole thing with breakout rooms planned. And <laughs> we didn't need it because this conversation was so great. So thank you, everyone who raised their hand and jumped in the chat as well. We'll share the recording, we'll share the slides so you have all these resources and we can pull the stuff from the chat as well. We're about to go to break. We'll be back in an hour, so uh, 2.30 Eastern, um, different wherever you are, for sessions on the return of the Baltimore Beat, uh, study and transform transformative um, relationships with philanthropy. So if you wanna get more on how to, to really build a deep relationship with a funder, that's a great session. Um, and also um, at 2.30, a session on collaborative fundraising with lessons from both Colorado and New Mexico about how you can fundraise to support a full ecosystem. So um, much more coming up this afternoon. Um, in the meantime, please feel free to go back to the Zoom Events Hub and jump in the chat, start one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. And um, we hope to, to see you um, moving forward. So thank you again. And, and thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you.